Hi, and welcome to another edition of our People First interview series, where we shine a light on great companies that not only do interesting and cool work, but most importantly, look after their people. Identify Global is a market leader in personalised career management and talent acquisition, specialising in the legal tech and legal services market. Check out identifyglobal.com for more information and the roles that we cover. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Richard Maybe and Thomas Forstner of Juro. Richard is the CEO and co-founder, and Thomas is an experienced people and talent professional who helps companies build best-in-class, repeatable talent people engines. Duro is an all-in-one contract automation platform that helps legal counsels and the teams they enable to agree and manage contracts in one unified workspace. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Richard. How are you? Doing good, thanks. Uh, sun's coming out, so I'm very much looking forward to the start of spring. So, very good, yeah. Thanks, Pete, for having us. No problems, yeah. Um, where I walk the dog, actually, there's uh, someone's put a sign out on, the, on their front lawn saying um, spring is a nice reminder of how good change can be. So uh, there we go. That's, it, uh, it always makes me smile in the morning. So um, Thanks for coming on, guys. I'm, I've been looking forward to this, and uh, you know, I've, I've been watching you guys um, with, with 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 admiration. Really, some of the stuff that you're doing around your sort of people and recruitment is fantastic, and uh, so it's great to be able to to talk to you about it and and help you share, you know, your story. But first and foremost, where, where, where are you? Where are you based, Richard? Where are you in the world right now? So, I mean, the company is um, is headquartered in London. Uh, we have offices in in Riga as well. Um, and we have a number of people distributed uh, throughout the world, really. Um, I, I happen to be currently in London um, for, for the obvious reasons of not being able to leave. Yeah. <laughs> and Thomas, yourself? Uh, so I've been working from a, a lovely small town in southern Germany, actually, for the past um, couple of months, which is quite a nice change of, um, of scenery from Zone 1 London, where I <laughs> usually live uh, around Hoxton, near a very busy street. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, excellent. Yeah, well, I think um, I think you're our first um, pair with uh, that are in different locations. So uh, we're truly taking the podcast global. So thank you for that. Um, I mean, first of all, most Thomas, let's um, let's let's talk about you. I mean, this we, we'll talk about Juro um, shortly, but um, let, let's let's talk about what's important, and that's the, that's the people. So, Thomas, tell us a bit about yourself. Obviously, you're in Germany at the minute, but what do you do when you're not leading the talent charge for? high growth tech startup um yeah i mean i usually do um a lot of travel um next to work and i tend to always have a holiday um booked or coming up which obviously isn't um super possible and hasn't been for the past year um beyond sort of exploring surrounding areas for for day trips but i've discovered yoga for myself um over the past 12 months like um so many others and i've also picked up again on studying japanese um, again, I lived in Tokyo for um, a while, so that's always been kind of a side interest of mine that I've let that slide, and um, creative writing uh, on the side as well. So um, kind of picking up a lots of lots of, kind of interests um, on the side, and that's sort of what I do um, outside of work usually. Wow. Okay. Fantastic. That um, that puts my reading and uh, walking to shame, doesn't it? So, um, <laughs> you about yourself. Well, so I have two children and I run a startup. So um, th- those sort of encompass my, my current hobbies. Um, but uh, in this sort of spare few minutes a week, I guess uh, I play the piano. So it's the sort of the main thing I do outside of, uh, of work. Okay. Any particular style of music or? Uh, jazz mostly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Fantastic. So Richard, if you don't mind me saying, you know, legal tech can have a bit of a reputation for being drab and boring and, so it's refreshing to hear about Juro's mission on, on making the contract process more human. So to talk to me about that. How did the idea come about and, and why, why, why was that important? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I started my career as a corporate lawyer, um, which is basically a way of saying you, you're a person who marks up contracts, right? So my, <laughs> my kind of um, entree into the world of contract automation was actually sort of doing the stuff manually. Um, using Microsoft Word, using redlining software, um, sending lots of emails, receiving lots of emails. Um, And I found that that was a a very inefficient and ineffective way of conducting and transacting business. Um, So I have a rather kind of cliched founder story, which is I sort of experienced the problem, I built a solution for it. 
Um, that journey was a bit meandering. So I, I kind of spent some time working for a US company called LegalZoom. Uh, I went and did an MBA in, uh, in Paris, um, but eventually I kind of came to found the company I wanted to found. And I think the, to your question on legal tech, um, yeah, deeply unsexy. Um, so <laughs> um, tech and legal, it's not, um, it's not naturally the place you, you would go. Um, so, so when we started the company, we, we kind of started with the premise of, um, you know, what is a contract, right? And um, you might have it and see it with the candidates you place all the time, right? Um, but contract is it's sort of this legal thing and this piece of paper and it's kind of piles of text. And no one, no one really understands it, right? If we're all honest, I mean, even, even me sometimes as a sort of trained lawyer, I sort of get a bit baffled by the text on this thing. But when you kind of strip it back to what it is, it's really just an agreement between people. Right. And, and I think when you start with the premise of a contract, which is an agreement between people at really important moments. So either a candidate has got a new job. Right. So they've signed an offer letter, or an employment contract. You've signed a new customer. You've taken on a supplier. Actually, that's a really positive moment. So we kind of got interested in that idea um, and this, this concept of making that whole process more human. Um, and by that, we mean more empathetic, more personal, more intuitive. Um, and that was you know, how, how we got going. And, you know, down the line, we started talking more and more about this concept of more human. And we started preaching this a lot in our products, thought this very design led and intuitive products. And we kind of started thinking, well, from a people and talent perspective, you know, how, how do we practice what we preach? And how do we bring this concept into, into that function? Yeah, I love that idea. Because you, you're right. I mean, a, a contract is often one of those things that are, are signed and, and, you know, and it's there in case stuff happens, right? And, and it's one of those things that people like to put in the top drawer and, and hopefully never have to refer to because actually, like you say, it's actually an agreement between two people ultimately and, and it's there. So uh, have you found any, uh, yeah, I mean, has it been plain sailing in terms of that adoption of people sort of resonated with that and gone, yeah, absolutely, you know, that's exactly what we're looking for or have, have people still tend to lean on the, the traditional ways of doing things? Well, I think, you know, in the early days, it was hard. So we're now kind of five years old as a company, right? So when you when you start up the, the sort of, um, you get a lot of pushback, right? You're really trying to change the way business is transacted. And for yeah. us, it's, it's taking contracts out of what literally everyone does, which is, you know, fill out stuff in a Microsoft Word document and turn it into a PDF and, you know, God forbid, print it and sign it and scan it um, into being browser native, right? So you are taking a contract to agreement without leaving your browser, right? That, that's quite radical. So in the early days, the people who kind of adopted our product, like Deliveroo was an early customer of ours, for example, uh, Secret Escapes and Babylon Health, were kind of you know, forward looking tech companies who are willing to embrace this different way of working. Um, and of course, there's kind of resistance and it's it, change management's hard. I think now, and especially over the last year, um, the way in which people have at work has fundamentally changed, right? As I think we all kind of feel, uh, we're currently on a Zoom, we might not have been on a Zoom this time last year. So the, the ways of working have changed. And we saw a kind of interesting trend over the last year where people realized that like no one owns a scanner in their home. Right? <laughs> so, so how do you actually get a contract agreed if you cannot do it digitally? So we saw a sort of big wave of adoption now in Juro becoming more of a mainstream way to transact business. Um, so definitely some change over time. Fantastic. Thomas, I know from our conversations, you, you were brought in to, to, to scale this team. And, and so perhaps you can talk about, you know, and we've just un talked about, you know, how unsexy the uh, legal tech industry could be. So perhaps you can talk about some of the challenges you were faced with. And, and you know, where, where do you start with, um, you know, recruiting people in, a, and, and I guess, in a, a, an un uncharted territory for, for what you're trying to achieve? Yeah, sure. I mean, so just to set the scene a little bit, when I started, there was just under 20 people um in the business and in terms of kind of what we had in place there was relatively little to hire at the speed that we needed to and the goal there was to roughly double the team in size from about 50 to 30 by the end of 2021 now roughly doubling um again and who knows what like 2022 um, might bring um on top of that we didn't really have anything in place to hire at a sustainable cost to the business since we were predominantly agency dependent at the time, which drove up our cost per hire by quite a bit. Um, and this included you know, the, the foundations of 
um, having you know, standard interview processes, um, having tooling in order to search for passive candidates, having a careers page beyond what um, applicant tracking systems, ATSs like offer out of the box. Um, and then to this, the kind of like, on top of all of this, the, the fact that most of the roles that we were trying to hire for didn't exist in the business yet which means that it wasn't just, you know, hire 10 more SDRs and hire three more engineers. Um, basically, every single new role was a project in itself. And we would need a solid discovery process that goes beyond your standard kickoff call um, to make sure that, you know, we know what's the problem we're trying to solve with this hire. Why is hiring somebody the best way to solve that problem? What do we need them to do? How do we look for it? And what most importantly, can we offer in return that other companies can't, barring the fact that, you know, legal is generally um, unsexy, et cetera. And that, that's also what appealed to me in Jura when I joined, which is the fact that there was an opportunity to build everything from scratch with relatively little legacy to contend with. That and the kind of like top tier VC backing, which you don't often see at Series A, um, as well as also the relative maturity, I would say, of how Juro conducts business, which you don't often expect. You think a 20 people startup is absolute chaos, every single like, uh, like place you look. And that wasn't the case um, when I joined. And I say there's a lot to candidates that it kind of runs like a mini established business already. And I credit this a lot to Richard and Pavel, who is the other co-founder, who really run a very, very good ship that, you know, has a lot of the like foundations already to um, help us accelerate our people and talent function um, in a much shorter time than it would be in, in other businesses. People have often underestimate the, the the amount of work that goes into you know building a recruitment function, and and it's often overlooked in terms of you know you put an advert out, people apply, and, and you offer them a job, and it's, it goes way beyond that in in, in many cases. So um, it's you know, to build those foundations, the things you're talking about, you sort of, I think you're underselling yourself a little bit there. I think, you know, the, the, the things, some of the things you've done, um, and certainly, you know, even the job adverts that you're putting out um, are, I guess, best practice. And, and a lot of people are afraid of doing that. So, you know, you, where you, you've ha you have to get to that stage. You can't, it's not a case of just putting out a fancy advert and saying, you know, come and join us, look how cool we are. Um, you know, the, it, it has to be backed up, you know, so, you know, th that building phase is really important. So wh where are you now with things then? So, you, I mean, in fact, the, the, let's talk about some of the things you put in place. So, you know, wh how are you doing that? What technologies have you used? Yeah. Um, so basically, like at that stage, you try to do everything in a very hacky way, right? So you don't have the resources to put a like super nice and shiny careers page uh, in place. You don't have the engineering resource to do that. And you probably don't have the budget either to have somebody do this for you. Yeah. Um, the good news is that at that stage, nobody expects you to have that either. So for us, when we, for example, tackle the, the very basic idea of how do we actually create a careers page that represents who we are as a business, because this is where we um, can really differentiate ourselves, which is, you know, the fact that the core values that we have in the business, they actually permeate into the people that we hire, the processes that we run, the policies that we um, enact, and working from kind of backwards of, okay, well, what is it that we are trying to display here all the way through, okay, how do we do this best, most simply, which is one of our core values, and then what does this actually look like? This is what led to a careers page that is very easily editable by anybody really, because it's in Notion, which is kind of a Swiss army knife of um, uh, like two legs, a wiki page internally, et cetera. All of our handbook is in there. And using that to essentially display our brand and who we are um, throughout. And I mean, this just kind of like before and after, like one year onward going from almost entirely agency dependent to where we are now, which is, agency makes up under 10% of the hires that we make. The rate of inbound candidates has increased to 30%. So a good third of our pipeline comes from people who actually like see us and they want to um, come to us. Um, and also you can't leave that out of the conversation. We are also inching closer to gender parity because one of the things that we do want to display um, in the things that we put out is that we are a company that actually does try our best. We haven't cracked it by any chance, but like we are trying our best to um, 
do actionable things to make sure that we are an inclusive workplace, that we are a workplace that um, champions diversity. We're not there, we're getting there. Um, but these are kind of the, the things that we're, um, we're getting to. So I'm going to come back to that um, in just a moment. But Richard, if, if I could perhaps come to you, you know, a lot of people will develop an in-house recruitment function, to save money, okay, I completely get that. Um, but you can just hire anybody to do that, um, you know, and, and it's pretty straightforward. So uh, obviously, you've hired Thomas and, and, and Thomas has, um, uh, you know, fantastic view of this and experience. But what, what was important to you when, you know, when trying to build that in-house own function? What, what, was it just about saving money? Or was there was there more behind it? I say it's very little to do with saving money. I mean, we're, we're kind of equity backed than we were at the time. Um, so cash wasn't the problem we needed to solve. Um, the, the, I'd say the challenge was much more around, um, are we hiring the right people? That is, that is really what I wanted to achieve, number one. And number two, I mean, Thomas is an exceptional individual and has taken, you know, people and talent to something isn't just like hiring people. It's not just that, right? It's something quite different and quite instrumental and foundational to the, to the whole company, right? So, so I think like a lot of that work that we did in the early days of working together, which was, um, you know, defining what our values are what were the expected behaviors um you know what kind of company did we want to build what why do people come to work you know what what are the the benefits not just like benefits that people give people but like what are the benefits that really make a difference to people and there's just like a huge amount of like hard work that happens there and i think once you get that right you can then build a talent layer which maybe works with external agencies as we do in some cases, maybe recruits internally, it doesn't matter so much. The only thing that really matters, I think, to us as a company is we consistently get exceptional candidates into the business and sort of looking for those top 1% candidates requires, you know, just a million things to go right. You know, as Thomas says, we do the discovery process correctly. Like we really work out like, do we need this person? What kind of person do we need? Um, are we really, really sure? Um, and then having a really tight process that tests not just is this person a good DP, right? I mean, that, that's the given, right? We're, we're, we're in a war for the best talent. So having a good CV is like, if you don't have it, you don't go to the, the phone screen. But then, you know, as, as you'll know, Pete, from the, from the process of hiring, there's just so much more that needs to happen. So, so I think, yeah, two things. Having um, a blended people and talent function, I think is very important. Um, and then having, having the right processes. I think the other thing I just mentioned is um, having found a buy-in is really important. Um, so I think if you know if the com if the company's founders don't really believe in this and don't really believe that it's important to create a purposeful place to work, um, it's really hard to it's just like the foundation isn't really there. So I think having founders devote time to it is now I try and devote about thirty percent of my time to HR, right, which is a lot. Um, and why? Um, because I believe on the pile to, to bring the best people in and fortunately in Thomas I have someone much more effective than than I am to actually make it happen. <laughs> Fantastic and, and and Thomas if we can talk about those cultures and values and and mm. you know what you've done because you've done some really exceptional work on actually how you um, you tie that into um, into your recruitment process because you know yes it is about finding the right person who can do the job but you go beyond that don't you so perhaps you can talk about you know where you're at now with that that particular part of the process gotcha so going all the way way back to um kind of the discovery of any new person that we try to bring into the business most people they start okay well what requirements do we want in this person what are nice to have and then you kind of search for that and maybe it goes well maybe it doesn't we start roughly like two steps earlier we essentially say okay cool what um are the main what is the main mission that this person um, needs to achieve in this business how does this person actually help us grow faster um and that then breaks down into a set of competencies that is tied to our um, core values for each of them let's say um in an account executive that we might be um, looking for one thing that is super important for us is that um, they actually bring a certain sense of creativity into the sales process. If they are, um, you know, get up against um, tough targets, what do they actually um, have, or what have they actually done in the past in order to kind of get to target anyway under adversity? Which is a good expression in very specifically as a, as a behavior in this role for 
our core value of trust and deliver, which is all around, you know, we give you the trust to do your work, however you um, see it fit. We're not going to micromanage um, your time, your working hours. We're not going to book you down with meetings. Um, however, we do um, very much expect that you use this trust um, to quote Spider-Man, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, but you use this to actually consistently deliver um, output. But in return, you know, when, when you talk about the value proposition of a business, it's, it's a term that is thrown around quite a lot and these are the things that we expect yes but also what are the things that we give back richard mentioned before like looking at all of the benefits that you've got um, in the business and making sure that all of these actually relate to our core values as well and that's um, one thing that we have um, we're, we're putting our handbook live in um, a couple of weeks where uh, hopefully other people can see this as well but every single thing that we put out there follows a set of principles that are actually based on the core values the reason why um, pretty much all of our um, time off policies buckets like sick leave um, medical appointments well-being time off um, is on a trust basis and ad limited harks back to the core values keep it simple trust and deliver the details be more human um, and these really are almost a litmus test for how your core values actually hold up in the business. You know, so many people, they lament that they are written on a wall somewhere and never looked at again. And that's really something that like makes or breaks your company at a very early stage because you cannot retrofit for that um, once, you're, once you're at like 100 or 120 people or um, God forbid, even larger. So you need to make sure that right now, this is incredibly explicitly anchored in all of the things that you put out, all of the people, policies, all of the perks and the benefits and in the people that you hire. Culture is a muddy thing, but we try and operationalize it in who do we hire, what do we offer people in return, and what are the processes by which we make decisions in the business. And that has worked pretty well. When we survey people, um, our engagement survey that we run quarterly is a consistent nine out of 10, which we're very happy about. Um, but one of the things that we ask in there is, you know, how well do you actually feel that the core values that we have in the business align? And do you know what those values um, are? And people typically report a relatively good fit. And even if they don't, um, they give us very actionable things to say, okay, here in this specific area, I think we're not living up to the values and we could do it instead um, in this way. So we have a lot of feedback loops as well to make sure that um, how our people understand what the values and culture in the business are actually ties um, back to help us improve as well as a business and i think that's really the gold standard of what you can try and achieve I, absolutely i think you know there's a, a report that goes around sort of annually the ceos and you know what their top priorities are and and they've, they've very rarely changed for, for for many many years it was you know stakeholder um you know or uh, vc support you know funding bottom line profit etc cetera, etc cetera. you know they're pretty standard business metrics for the first time you know culture has, has become one of the the number one priorities you know there's an obvious reason for that you know it drives bottom line growth as well happy employees make you know happy business means profitable business you know well hopefully so it has is that is that on your agenda, Richard? Is that, you know, is, why is culture important to you as a, as a CEO? Yeah, I mean, well, that's an easy question. I, mean, I think it's important to us because um, the company cannot operate without having the best people in the company um, and having longevity in the company. Uh, it's the sort of the, the boring business reason. Um, I think the kind of, the, the, the more important question I feel is how, how do you actually build a good culture, right? And I think this is something where, you know, a lot of people will say you know, we want to have a good culture, but actually don't take the required actions in order to make that happen. Right. So the, the example Thomas gave is a kind of classic one where rather than having a value on a wall saying, you know, uh, we will work well together and you sort of walk past the sign and go, well, I must remember to work well together, whatever <laughs> that means. You, you build something meaningful. Right. And you build the artifacts of these values. Culture, it, I believe, is really like the sum of the least good behaviors in the business, right? So you can't really control the culture. The culture sits on the right-hand side of the equation. But what you can control is the behaviors, and you can 
uh, reward good behaviors and you can correct bad behaviors. And we've done it in you know, lots of ways that seem very little. So we have like a weekly award for the juror of the week, of course, tied back to one of our values. Uh, and that just gives an opportunity to reinforce like behaviors that we think are, are really, really great. So it is, it is very important. The, the other thing, which, and I talk about this in my kind of onboarding session with new hires is, if we take one step back, you have to think as a business as to which stakeholders are most important to you, right? And I think as a CEO, you have many to juggle. So you've got your investors, you've got the board, you've got employees, you've got contractors, suppliers, customers, partners, endless people competing for different things, essentially. And so one of the kind of decisions we made as a company is how do you stack those in priority? Because you know, the one thing we know is we can't be all things to all people and keep everyone happy. So we kind of decided on this employee first standpoint, which says, if we hire the absolute best people and enable them at work, they're going to do a really good job for our customers. And because they're doing a really good job for our customers, uh, our investors can, can make lots of money and a good return from, from the company. And it, it seems very trite, right, and kind of obvious thing to say, but I think a lot of companies start by flipping that on its head let's start a company to make money. And then, yeah, we probably need some customers. And, oh no, we've got to get some people to do this like work, right? And I think if you think about it in that, in that way, it, it just, it's never going to work like that. Um, I think bringing in great people and, and enabling them to work in a company that you can be proud of, that's like, everything else kind of takes care of itself, right? If you get that piece right. And that's why I think for us, it's so important. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It is everybody talks like that, you know, and they put some some really nice words on a wall and, you know, maybe throw a few beanbags around and and expect everything to be cool and happy. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's much more than that. And to for it to be a part of the building blocks of your business is um, is quite unique, actually, as I say. And and I think and I say that with some clarity because. I've seen some of the things you guys have put into place and the way that you're doing it and you, you live and breathe it and, and, and you know, it's and more credit to you. So um, I, I think it's just the start of, um, you know, the world domination, I guess, for, for, for your parts of part of business. So um, Thomas, you, you've achieved a lot in, in, in the short space that you've been there. So, you know, what's planned, you know, what, what else can you do? I mean, where, where else can you take this? Yeah. I mean, um, just for, uh, Kind of where we are now is probably a good kind of starting point to see well, what we what what do we not have in place and you know we we got to a good place we actually achieved that goal of getting from fifteen to thirty people um, within a year we're about well on track to um, get to double that size again our cost per hire is um, down to a very manageable um, level we actually cut it uh, into a third of what it was uh, a year ago. Um, excellent Gloucester reviews, uh, etc. However, there's the, the, the there's one thing here which is um, an issue that I've seen pop up in past like fast growing companies, especially post Series A, which is that you have all of these great people that you went to great lengths in hiring, and at some point um, people start leaving because you cannot retain them because you have focused way too much on making an excellent candidate experience and like getting these fantastic people in there. And then you don't actually have the tangible things in place to make these people stay and flourish with the business. Talk about what Richard said about flipping it on its head, right? You're trying to get a lot of people like into the business, but then it becomes essentially a letdown because people um, come in there and it turns out to be like, kind of like any old um, beers on Friday, bean bags and foosball tables um, kind of startup, which isn't really a differentiator in the business um, anymore. And what we're planning right now, and in fact, are doing a lot of work in is basically two things. Number one is um, starting early in building a career progression framework for the entire business. So really making sure that every single person at uh, Juro always knows where they are right now, what steps they need to, to, to get to the next step. They have flexibility in branching out to different ways of what um, their progression within the business could look like. Again, always tied back to our values, to our core mission, et cetera. Um, and the second thing is genuinely building a place early that shows we are walking the walk when it comes to including a broad variety and arguably a representative subset of the population. And 
this is where I feel a lot of these panel discussions that you often get sometimes during Pride Month around you know diversity and inclusion, they stop at this point where everybody pats themselves on the back and it's like, we all agree to agree and let's go back into our companies and there's perhaps a DEI policy in place or there isn't. Um, and, and ways that we're tackling this is not by doing something that nobody has ever thought of before. We're simply looking at all of the policies that we have right now from different perspectives and saying, okay, how can we make this work better for women, for underrepresented groups like LGBTQ, like people of faith, like people with a neurodiverse background? And we're going through it step by step um, and actually trying to say, okay, well, what is it that would make more people feel like okay this company is actually serious when it comes to this so you know companies might say oh you know we've got a um like equal opportunities line under all of our job specs um but you know what do you actually have uh, in place to uh, accommodate women's health for example you know um does your sick day or sick, sick policy explicitly include uh, women being able to take time off because of period cramps, let's say, because this affects women more than men. And this is often kind of swept under the rug. If um, Ramadan is coming up uh, in the future, are you making provisions for um, employees who are fasting during that time to shift their workload during the uh, to the mornings? Are you making sure that you're not putting like big company wide meetups during this time? Do you actually have a designated prayer room? If you don't, are you doing something else to in, uh, ensure that this employee can perhaps work from home more often. Like it's, it's these very little things that I genuinely believe is what makes a workplace different in terms of the, the, the way that it runs its people and by extension, Explorer brand. I'm of the firm belief that I am absolutely not going to shout out uh, about like what a like fantastic diverse um, workplace we are because we're not yet, we're getting there, but we haven't cracked this either. However, I'm going to be very proud when we actually have tangible, measurable, meaty things in place where we're saying, okay, you know, to all the people that, um, you know, uh, have a particular vested interest in making sure that, you know, this place respects your needs, here's exactly what we're doing, like point A, B, and C. And this is what we're currently like planning and also then planning to shout about once we've gotten to a, to a good place over the next couple of months. It's you, you touched on a point there that's close to my heart in, in around, you know, a lot of people talk about it, you know, and actually let's all get together and let's talk about, you know, you know, that we should be doing things. And then, you know, they, 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 they invite a, a collection of people into, in, into that meeting that, that are, don't always represent <laughs> the diverse nature of the community. And, um, and then they talk about, you know, these are the things we should do and let's, let's update our policies and actually we should be a bit more proactive about that. And, and I think, um, and, and as I always say, anything that starts with should never gets done. So uh, uh, it, you've gone way beyond that. And actually you're, it starts with being proactive and, you know, you've, you've, you've done some really great things. So um, perhaps talk about your, your sort of open sourcing um, approach to um, diversity. Sure. I mean, when we when we talk about sort of like open sourcing this, like what do, what do we really mean here? The, the the very simple thing that it breaks down to is just ask people um, based on you know what what is most important um, to them. Like I'm uh, part of the LGBTQ community. I probably have a better sense of what I think other people might. Um, need or be interested in than uh, like um, white straight um, cis male. I will also acknowledge that um, I have probably no idea um, to the extent that a female colleague might have to what it is to experience sexism in the workplace. And starting with that acknowledgement and the fact that, you know, you probably don't know everything. Um, so your best bet is simply taking a lot of knowledge that is out there in. Let's take an example of, um, you know, just making sure that um, people of faith are included. It's not like this information is hard um, to find. Um, if you go to the, the website of the UK um, Muslim Council, there is a lot of resource out there that just says, okay, here's the couple of things that um, you can do to make your um, workplace more inclusive. These aren't hard things. These aren't things that take a lot of resource to implement and they cost absolutely nothing, um, but they are genuinely appreciated. So I, I like when you, you know, talk about, you know, sort of 
these panel discussions, they might have like representative people or they might not. Oftentimes it feels like very forced almost to a degree where you're like, you gotta make sure you've got sort of like one of um, one of everybody. And these are, are fantastic like first step, don't get me wrong. Creating awareness is step one, but step two and three are training and consequence. You gotta make sure that people actually are aware of how to be allies and standing for people who uh, might not feel comfortable to do this for themselves. And then you need to make sure that you take a good 70 to 80 percent of the things that they do into account in some way and that you know breaks down all the way to you know people who cannot take bright lights in the workspace is that something that you know you're aware of is this something that we're countering um and and this is when where i think like open sourcing this really comes into effect like genuinely just look at the people that you have inside right now that have your trust within the business the people that are like slightly outside of it and just simply like take into account what they do is literally in the word inclusion and it sounds um, bland if you say it like this, but this first step is oftentimes not done. Companies think that they have to put like some grand scheme out of there, but it's a collection of lots of little things at very low cost and very low energy to the business that is actually gonna make a difference. And that's also what I think is going to differentiate us as a as a um, like player in the like SaaS startup world as a as a as company that at a very small stage early on yeah. actually acknowledges trains and shows that it takes actionable steps to do things and, and maybe to just briefly add to that so I'd second everything Thomas is saying on it but um I think like one one thing that I I, I have heard in the past um, people say is you know is this work we're doing compatible with growth right so is this just making like a nice place and a happy environment and just because you know Richard and Thomas think it's the right thing to do like is it the right thing for the business and I think there's there's really incredibly compelling evidence to suggest that more diverse work uh, forces will achieve better outcomes right and that might be diversity of gender sexual orientation ethnicity um, viewpoints opinions the list goes on but that's the other reason why we do it, right? Is we actually believe we will grow faster and build a more sustainable company with that. And I think, you know, that that is clearly one area I think we have a long way to go in. Um, I think we've made progress over the last year, but, you know, I would like really to see um, in hard metrics, those numbers changing. So whether that's gender diversity uh, within the team, whether that's, um, you know, ethnic diversity, it's, it's, it's very important. And I think setting that as a, a key company goal is something we're going to be doing going forward. Yeah, I think often, and it is that people try to retrofit inclusion into the business. You know, the, the, can we make it work? You know, our business doesn't allow for time off for you know religious reasons or you know health reasons. It, you know, and and actually. Um, you know, people often think it's it's too far to change, and you guys are a testament to the fact that you can change it. And actually, it's a it's 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 a destination. You know, it's not you know it's you, you're not going to get there overnight. You know, it takes time and it takes effort, and it takes you know backing, as you said earlier. You know, um, support from you know from all angles of the business, not just someone who's got a good idea. Um, you know, who who always wants to beat the drum. You know, it's it's a it's a, an organization wide approach. And um, and it has to resonate all the way through to your hiring processes, which is you know what you guys are doing. So you know it is a lot of work, it is a lot of effort, and um, it does mean a change of thinking. But I guess that's that's what we need, right? So um, uh, you've, um, you've you've done lots as well around um, you know looking after your people. I mean, let, let's um, let's talk about that for for a moment. Where um, you know I've seen some of your stuff on online and. Um, love letters and, and all sorts that have gone out to, to people. So, um, you know, you, you don't, you're not just talk, you know, talking about it. You're actually, you're actually doing this stuff. You, you know, you are getting people in, you are looking after them. So uh, give us some of the things that you've done over the last 12 months to, to look after your people. Sure. I mean, th that kind of starts at by defining what, problems actually have been facing, especially over the last year during lockdown. Many companies, I feel they equate support for people with free therapy, um, which is kind of the, the, the wrong way um, around it is essentially saying, we know you're gonna like struggle, so here's a blanket solution. Uh, <laughs> however, the one thing that we, we have found is that you ask 10 different people on you know, what they're struggling with, um, with this exceptional situation, and you will get five different answers. So, you know, big whoop, everybody is different. Um, 
And on top of that, you know, symptoms of mental ill health are typically just like the tip of the iceberg. They are the end result of a deeper root cause problem. And from the feedback that we've gathered regularly, we saw basically three things that people mostly struggled with. Number one, their at-home setups weren't ideal. Number two, because of the general stresses of the pandemic, they weren't able to meet colleagues, friends, which puts them at like higher susceptibility of ill health. And then number three, um, some people simply struggle with the novelty of working remotely, right? You can't see your, uh, your colleagues leaving the office, hence you feel like you should leave too. You can't see your colleagues going out for lunch, hence you're probably not taking breaks um, yourself as well. And then factor into this the, the off-the-line Zoom fatigue. None of these issues are unique to Juro, but the way that we dealt with them over the past year is, I like to think in a relatively like uniquely um, Juro way. So thinking about the second point of, you know, the higher susceptibility to mental ill health, rather than just, you know, putting a benefit in place and say, you know, here's therapy for when you need it. Um, we went for a three-step um, mental health initiative, which we, um, blogged about uh, a while ago that, you know, again, starts with awareness, making sure that you um, start a discussion, create a space where it is okay for employees to talk about their own mental state with their managers, uh, training. All of our managers are mental health first aiders. Um, we have a lot of resources to actually help managers how to like guide that discussion, how to ask somebody else for um, support. And then, yes, as a last step, on a company level, we have things in place like Spill, which is a um, like online mental health provider who you can book um, therapy um, or uh, sessions for, through or like ask a therapist a question. There's this weird misconception that you can only take therapy when you have a problem. So when your health is bad or when, like God forbid, you do have a mental condition, um, when actually this is more of a sounding board, right? This is supposed to help you flourish or help you, you know, um, do even better. And structuring the conversation that way, we think gives a lot more value add to um, our team. And we've seen this also in, you know, how we measure um, the, the, the balance state of our, of our team, like the, the, the opposite of, um, you know, burnout, let's take it, is not engagement, it is balance. Um, and for the other two things, you know, we simply got people a flexible work from home um, budget uh, together with recommendations on how they best use it, lumbar support, standing desk, better Wi-Fi connection, what have you. And we also have a lot of, you know, guidelines that we're rolling on now for how to get more deep work done, how to have higher quality meetings, how to say no to things that will not help you make your time better, um, et cetera. As um, you, you talk, obviously, the remote working, everyone sort of, you know, became remote overnight. Did you operate remote working before? Yeah, so, so we had at least some degree of remote working um, prior to that, um, quite a different degree. Um, so we've always had two offices since inception. Um, yeah. So we've never been all in kind of one room. And we had, you know, a couple of people working full, full remote at that point. Obviously, that changed dramatically as of, you know, March 2020 to a full remote working situation. So I don't think we were fully prepared for that. Uh, it wasn't you know, a seamless transition, it was probably better than for some. Uh, obviously we're in the business of producing software. Um, so you know, there's no requirement to be in a premises, for example. Um, but I think this is something that's become very front of mind, I guess, for everyone. Um, I think there's kind of two things which worry me about this. Um, the first is, um, I think it's now pretty much beyond dispute that Zoom fatigue is a thing, um, that there are uh, real and uh, issues around burnout. Burnout is real uh, and it's happening to a lot of people right now. Um, and I think, you know, no one really knows how this is going to play out, but we see the symptoms, you know, uh, in people where um, uh, just just endless meetings of stuff, like even stuff like staring yourself at yourself on a screen uh, mm. is uh, anxiety inducing <laughs> uh, to some people. So, so this is kind of, you know, bu bucket one. I think on distributed working specifically, um, just forgetting for a moment the me mental health impact on that, I don't think we yet have a really good idea of how that's going to pan out post-pandemic. 
Um, and we are, you know, a flexible employer now um, and a certified one. And so we will likely see a situation in which some people will be remote, some people will be in the office, and some people will be doing a little bit of both. So we're kind of taking active steps now to ensure that that is smooth. Um, and obviously for people who are going to be working remotely forever, we want to support them. So as Thomas said, whether it's, you know, very basic things like, you know, having a budget for setting up a home office, um, whether it's um, having a, a meaningful work kind of initiative, which is sort of giving guidelines on when, whether you need a meeting or not, these things help. But I think perhaps a little bit more, uh, a little bit higher level than that, we're starting to think about things like, what if we had a manager who was fully remote and they had a team of five who are coming into the office every day, right? How, how does that dynamic play out? And how can we ensure that that like relationship is, is effective. Um, and of course, it's absolutely possible that it can be, but I think with everything, unless the company is taking active steps to make sure that we support that way of working, we're making a big mistake. Um, so again, we're, we're in the early stages of thinking about it, but I think you know, distributed working will be a, a big theme as will, you know, as Thomas has said, mental health. Yeah, I think I've seen this already in, in lots of organizations, you know, three four five months ago it was like yeah we're just going to be remote now completely let's not worry about it now all of a sudden there's a some sense of optimism and and returning to work everyone's gone ah, okay um maybe we would like them in the office a little bit and maybe they do need a little bit a little closer and that changes the dynamics in your talent pool you know you've gone from having a global talent pool to having a semi-global talent pool to maybe just a, a macro <laughs> you know talent pool and i think you know, and that's the, the 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 issues. And and you're absolutely right. Is that I think we will see a new style of leadership that is required to to manage at distance. You know, full time. If if that, you know, it's different if you're seeing someone. You know, a few days a week because you can have those in face, important face to face discussions. But if they are fully remote, you know, you need to. It's a different style. You know, we're 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 doing it like this now, and and it does require a different tact and a different approach to. Um, um, to, to, to have those meetings because essentially you're diving into someone's home, you know, potentially. So I, I totally agree. And I think that that's a super interesting point, right? Which is, you know, pe people talk about the sort of uh, the work-life balance being broken down. I think everyone's sort of spoken about this. Probably everyone understands mm. what that means um, having experienced it. But, you know, I think from a company's perspective, you can also think of it in another way, which is the company is actually intruding into the home, right? Um, so, so when we think about you know, things like if my son was to knock on the door here in the middle of this punk podcast, you know, I might naturally be like horrified and apologizing, but I, I really shouldn't, right? Because, you know, my, my son is probably, no offense, marginally more important, right? And I think we see this, this kind of work-life blend playing out. So it's a really interesting thing for the company um, to think about. And if we go all the way back to the beginning of this conversation to our mission uh, of making contracts more human and our core value of be more human, I think this is paramount, right? Because um, when you strip away all of the sort of professionalism and all of the sort of what it means to be in a company and to wear smart clothes and whatever you need to do, um, you're stripping back to what, why do we go to work? And we go to work, of course, to get paid, uh, of course, because uh, it's interesting, but often, and what we like to promote is people go to work to find purpose. Right. So it's our job as a company to ensure that that happens. And if it's really not happening, we're not doing our job correctly. Right. People will get burned out. Uh, people will feel like work has become intrusive on their personal life. So I think this, again, will be another big theme. And we're, you know, early in thinking about how we can address that. Yeah, fantastic. Um, a couple of quick quiet questions um, that I'd like to finish off. One one for you, Thomas, and, um, and one for you, Richard. So, um, Thomas, what does it mean to work for Juro? From because I'm not going to ask you, Richard, because uh, you know I'm going to give it to give it to Thomas this one. Yeah, I got to be careful what I say here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess in a nutshell, to me, it means working for a place that is exceptionally well run, at a very small size, and that has, when I joined, and is now giving me confidence that it will continue to grow at a healthy rate. So that's on the like very basic like robotic like this um side of, of, of things but it also means working for a place that 
helps me make an easy decision of working for it every day. If you think about like employees, they wake up in the morning and they make a conscious decision to say, I want to keep working for this place. If they don't, um, you are going to have a problem. And the fact that I have a clear mission, I have clear expectations for what I'm supposed to deliver, and then almost entire ownership over how I go about this together with the values essentially guiding for how I should go about them. That is pretty fantastic. And, you know, having those values then anchored in how I make decisions, how I work with each other, uh, how, I, how I hire. Um, that's really what it means to me. And it seems people, um, candidates and employees alike, tend to, um, tend to agree with that, which I'm pretty happy about. Yeah, fantastic. And I'm flipping this on and said, this is for you, Richard. So, you know, what piece of advice would you give to your peers, um, you know, other sort of talent, um, business owners um, on building a, a talent function that, that um, supports your business values? Invest, I think would be my advice. Um, I think there's underinvestment in, in people and talent generally, right? So that might be that you just wait too long to bring an in-house team in. It may be that you uh, scrimp on agencies and you try and find agencies that are gonna give you the best price. It doesn't really matter hugely, right? Like ultimately, if you invest, you're gonna get the best people in. And there's a clear return. So um, sometimes the return is just pretty obvious. You hire a great salesperson. If they're twice as good as like another salesperson, they're gonna more than pay for themselves in terms of the cash investment. Um, sometimes it's more tangential, right? You bring someone in operations and all of a sudden the business is becoming more efficient. So um, I don't really have any more advice than, um, than invest and, and care about it, right? I mean, what you know, do you want to build a company to just make a little bit of money? I'm sure I could make money more easily by being a lawyer, right? <laughs> um, you know, build, build a company you're proud of, right? And if, if, you, if you start with the right values and you invest, um, then it has a compounding effect. You hire people who also have the right values. They hire people who also have the right values. And all of a sudden, when you kind of get to, as we will from you know, 30 to 50 to 100 to 1,000 to hopefully 10,000 people, you've built a company that people want to work for. And if people want to be there and they turn up every day to find purpose and do really interesting work, then everything's just a little bit easier. Uh, as I said kind of earlier, you're going to have more successful customers and you're going to have more successful investors. Um, the, the one other just very quick thing I might mention is that I'm a big believer in given, giving uh, equity ownership to all employees. So we have a policy at Juro that everyone is, is a, a shareholder in the company as well as uh, just getting a salary and bonus and whatever. And I think the nice thing that plays out there is we start to think of employees as our investors, right? So they invest time and they get shares in return. Um, and so, of course, we take a bet on the employee and we've just been talking about the processes we go through to try and make the right bets. But also the employee is taking a bet on us. And we know I mean, most of the candidates we work with are coming in multiple offer scenarios. They could go and get a job at Google tomorrow or Facebook or wherever they want to go. So, so how do we compete? And, and I think we can compete by just having the right, the right attitudes and providing the right, the right environment. Fantastic. Well, if you're listening to this and you like the sound of what Dura have to offer, then I encourage you to check out their website. Um, not only do they produce some really fantastic content, um, but uh, they have lots of great opportunities as well. So check them out. And uh, um, hopefully, if, uh, if they're listening to this, they will um, they'll check out your website. So, um, guys, really, really interesting chat. I really appreciate your time. And uh, there's some really valuable stuff there. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's been great having you on. Thanks very much. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, Pete. Good to talk to you.